Welcome to Tez Talks Radio. I'm your host, Marissa True. And on today's episode, I am joined by Paul Schmidt, the Chief Operating Officer of FX Hash, the largest generative art marketplace on Tezos, and dare I say, blockchain overall, rivaling that of art blocks. So, first of all, Paul, welcome. Um, this interview is well overdue and a long time coming. So, how are you doing today? <laughs> first of all, thank you. Um, I'm doing good. So, uh, cannot complain too much. It's like too hot, but like I'd rather it's too hot than too cold. So dealing with the European summer heat waves. Um, yeah, I live we... in the tropics, so I don't think it's that big of a deal, personally. Like you, you have an AC, we don't. We have just old buildings, and I'm living like on the fourth floor, so it's warm. <laughs> heat does rise. <laughs> so anyway, as is customary, we start our interviews with the questions that we share with all guests on the show, which is your journey into blockchain. What was it? And how did you also enter the world of generative art? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, how did I start with blockchain? So I think I started like many. I just bought Bitcoin and ETH and didn't understand anything. That was, I think, like I'm fairly late joining. I think that was like in 2018. Um, like I was still like doing my studies, like doing like finance stuff. Um, and I just saw, saw more and more people like getting into Web3, crypto, like building on the weekends. And I thought it was like quite interesting. Um, I was like trying to find what I want to do as my like first real job. And, and it just like seemed like a good place to be in. So I just like learned, learned a lot about it, tried to teach it on my own. There were like these Masari reports always at the end of the year. These were like a great resource for me. And then I always was interested in fashion, art, and any of those things. Uh, so I was like trying to look into like an actual apply, like actual things that you could use the blockchain for. As like DeFi didn't really interest me as much as I back then didn't get it now, not really get it as well. But um, like art, I did get, and with that, I sort of like found ETH obviously in the beginning, but it was way too pricey to me. I was a student. I really didn't understand why I needed to pay $200 for a simple transaction. Uh, so I searched for other alternatives. First bought my first PFP, thought I would be rich, didn't get rich, but then found Tezos. <laughs> <laughs> but then, then found Tezos and Ticket Nunk and really loved it and was like totally amazed. Like I was for the first time in my life, I could be like purchase art in that sense and call myself an actual owner, not just like look at it in a museum or gallery. Uh, so that really opened up my eyes to like the, the, the bigger things. And back then I was like doing like the art block summer, got really interested in like generative art, but was like sadly priced out out of it for like the aforementioned reasons of being a student and just not being loaded with ETH. Um, and then I, um, like, I, I don't know, like I jumped through like um, discords or Twitter and then Hicket Nunk died and on the same day, essentially FX Hash started was like on like an internship, like on like a train ride and essentially just uh, like minted like for four hours, everything that I could on FX hash. And ever since then I've become like a huge advocate and lover for journal of art in that sense. Um, and that's really how I got started, like actually co collecting and understanding all of it. And uh, I still am, I would not call myself like an expert or anything like that, but uh, I knew a little bit. I, I know a little bit by now. Out of curiosity, what was the first PFP you collected that you did <laughs> profit off of? Um, I, how would I call it? I think um, um, something with siblings, like silvers, like stormy siblings. I don't know. Like it, it was super stupid. But they had like a little channel within their Discord, which was Tezos. And ultimately, it just paid off eventually not just like in the monetary styles that i thought um silver silver siblings silver surface siblings i don't know like um it was like kind of pfp craze it was stupid so in a weird way your bad investment decision actually did yield a profit in the long run because it brought you here to the tezos ecosystem so in a way you do yes. owe something to the pfp yes but mostly just like understanding that I'm, I was stupid. I still am stupid. And you should, you should think about it. Everybody says, go right and maybe think about why not left. <laughs> in that sense, like if you're searching for asymmetrical returns. But yeah, 
um, it benefited me in the long run. And you said that you weren't particularly interested in DeFi. You weren't necessarily particularly interested in the cryptocurrency space, but what you liked was how blockchain and culture were starting to overlap. But before you were collecting NFTs, were you big into art collecting in general? And also, what was it about FX Hash Mints that had you so addicted to the process? Before if you I had, joined the team, if I would have the money, then yes, I for sure would have collected art. But ultimately, like even if you are at like a small state, a small scale gallery, like you still need to pay five hundred thousand, like much more, like two or three thousand dollars or euros to get like anything that is like worth hanging up, in my opinion. So it's just harder to get started in that sense. Um, what made it easy on FX Hash? Um, it was open like you, you had for the first time really like a as an like multiple artists multiple collections to choose from it wasn't everything minted out like immediately i mean yes it was but like there was so much great art on there so straight from the get-go that if you just stayed on the side and back then like there wasn't scheduling or anything it was literally just like you wait on the side, you click refresh, there's a new artwork there. <laughs> and then you could just buy it. And that was really, uh, oh, nearly fall down my chair. Um, that was really, um, how do you say, addicting in that sense. And I think uh, back then we also had like a switching schedule. So because of the demand, um, like FX Hash had to actually close down like a normal retail shop. Um, and then it would like start again at like different times for everyone. So at times it was like 4 a.m. Uh, for me and i but i knew like there was a drop coming so i like actually set an alarm and all of that and um just like this shared community space of like everybody being in it for the art and uh, finally being like let go to collect being let go of like high transaction fees being let go of extremely high prices um yeah and just creating like a fostering community in that sense around art and not around prices in that sense um i think that's what like drove me there then kept me there um, and I think like on the first day that I was on there, I just like DM ciphered and was like, Hey, let me help you. Um, and that's then how I got started to be a mod. And then from like others also joined, became a mod. And then the sort of like team originally grew out of that. So I actually remember when FX hash first came on the scene because my colleague, David, when I was at TZ APAC actually brought it to my attention and said, there's a whole generative art marketplace. And my first question you know, was, what is generative art? And the concept <laughs> of it was quite hard to wrap my head around at that point in time, because the combination of coding, creativity, and semi-randomized output was quite hard to grasp as someone who, one, wasn't well-versed in the art world, and two, wasn't really well-versed in code. But in the last year alone, FX Hash has made a huge name for itself. It's one of the largest generative art market NFT marketplaces in Web3. It stands shoulder to shoulder with Artblocks, and Artblocks at the time was the number one. It was almost the incumbent overnight. So you said that you had message ciphered asking to be a mod, which is how you first got involved in helping him out. But what was the actual story for how FX Hash began? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, that's rather simple. So Cypher is, is a, like, amazing <laughs> generative artist himself. Uh, he's been like software developer in that sense, I think, since he's like 10. So for the past 15, 16 years by now. Um, and he just, he always like did like small scale installations near where he is from in France, like near, near Lyon. Um, but ultimately, he did not really have a tool uh, to like showcase his work and to like distribute it as much. Um, and he always wanted to have a, like Instagram feel to it. So and, like, if you have a nice photo, you can upload it on Instagram stories or posts or reels, whatever, but like, you can just do it. Like you don't have to ask for permission. And back then everything was, and even today, mostly everything still is curated. Uh, even if they say they are open, most of them are curated. Um, so, but he's essentially just like, uh, built a platform for himself. Um, and then basically set that out like really in this like open spirit and really just like released it. Um, and I, I don't think he thought it would gain traction. Uh, funnily enough, like he started a new job like the week, Monday after it was first released. So he really did not plan for this to go like bigger. Um, but I think like within a month of him just like trying, essentially like, I mean, 
you know, it's sort of like it, it sort of like spiraled out of control for a little bit. And um, then we just said like, okay, but aside for it, like at least you need to do it full time. And then the rest of us joined later, uh, but really he built it because he needed and wanted a tool for artists to release to of art. And that is still our mission and why we're so like artist focused on like actually shipping new products and tools mostly catered around artists and not catered around like the marketplace or like how to flip easier in that sense. So FX Hash was essentially born because the creator of it was just developing solutions for himself and his own work. But then, as you said, it picked up very rapidly. It was almost like overnight, suddenly generative art was at the forefront and it spiked, like the spotlight was burning down onto it. But what do you think it actually was that spurred all the traction? Was it just, you know, NFT fever? Or was there something particularly special about generative <laughs> art? Uh, I, I wish I could say NFT fever, but actually we only existed in like the bear market. We were too late to get anything of like a, a positive market in that sense. I think it was like a combination of things. So for artists, they had the big pain point of not being able to release their work, especially not long form generative work. Collectors had like the big pain point of like not being able to afford work in that sense and having to like only have like a very selected um, choice uh, in, the, in that sense for them to buy. And then obviously like Hikenung died. So there was a lot of like missing activity, so to speak. Or like there was a platform missing essentially where like the people hang out on. Um, and then essentially like we had, it sounds stupid, but we had product market fit within the first day essentially. Um, and then it's just also like, there were of course like these network effects within Discord, within Twitter, uh, with artists talking to each other. And that is actually also why, if you look at the first 100 projects that we have on FX Hash, um, the quality is insane. Like uh, I personally, you can even say that's like on par with like Artbox Curated, for example, because all of these artists just, artists just sat on their projects and was like, okay, this is now finally a chance for me to release it. And if there's great art, then the collectors will follow. And it was just like a, a re like a flywheel effect, I think is how you call it in the beginning. Um, that helped us a lot. And what was it about generative art specifically that made it so popular as an art genre within the blockchain art space? It actually makes sense <laughs> because we like w within generative art, you actually utilize something like off the blockchain. So what uh, we do it at Epic Session, I think also most other platforms operate is uh, when you click on Mint, your transaction hash that is completely unique to your own transaction to you clicking the mint button and will get injected into the code into the alg algorithm and will actually see it randomness. So every like if I buy something and you buy something like of course, yes it's the same algorithm for the same project but our hash is unique so therefore our output is unique and you can always replicate it. So I think that is like the much more technical part of things because it's like actually a tool that utilizes blockchain the way it's used to be it's not just uploading a png or anything but it like it works together in unison um and then the other thing is probably that um we consume more and more digital stuff online but like genitive art really has not been like it has been around since the 60s essentially since computers have been created um but there was like a lacking, like the, the artists could not really financialize or could not really sell their artwork. And again, like with blockchain, it sort of like helped that. So like it's shown like a bigger and better spotlight on it. Um, and I think there was just like a lot of collector demand for it. It was like, it's like a new, it's new and exciting, especially for like the younger generation that doesn't have the money to collect art, but is like has grown up in like the digital world, might be able to like know and understand code, like can also create code or like create artworks on their own without needing to have like the hand eye coordination that you might need if you <laughs> want to do like a, a other kind of art or like more traditional kind of art. Um, so like open up a, a, a lot of new groups in that sense um, to be able to appreciate art. And I think that is what is driving and what will be driving generative art. Um, yeah. And then, okay. So basically what we're saying is that there was a beautiful synergy in blockchain technology and the uniqueness in that and generative code, like generative art code, and then the, the process of generating unique outputs. 
And then things mm -hmm. really took off at the Tesla's exhibitions at basically every single art Basel worldwide. So you were in Hong Kong all the way mm -hmm. through to Miami, which was a huge opportunity for generative artists mm -hmm. who were minting their work on FX hash to actually present their work on a on you know a global stage at one of the world's mm -hmm. largest art fairs. So you guys were very much front and center of, across those shows. So what were the like you know what were the main takeaways from that experience? Um, it uh, there were a lot of experiences in that uh, or like takeaways. I think what was interesting to see this first of all, like the more we came to those events, the better people understood and the different the questions were in that sense. So we sadly couldn't travel to Hong Kong. Um, because of, or like, like we as like the FX hash team, we couldn't travel, but like the TZ APEC team did. So I don't know the questions there, uh, but like in Basel, it was really like rudimentary and then going to Paris and then to Miami, the questions got better and better. And that was like, okay, there's an actual sense of understanding. People start to appreciate it. Um, and then we also sort of like learn together with Tezos and that's to, to tell a story around the booth. And the beginning was much more just like, hey, this is art and this is cool. Um, but with everything in art, you need to like contextualize it for people to understand it in that sense. And then these like really harsh outliners of this is stupid, this is like NFT, this is just like a PFPs, like they also like diminished uh, the further we went in that sense. But really, it's about like contextualizing it also, not maybe like, or like at least for me, like in Paris, uh, we also had like plots and prints. And I think that was really cool because here you can draw in a lot of people that might just like uh, categorically be like, okay, it's a screen, it's not art for me, but if it's like a digital artwork on the sort of like canvas that they know and they love, then you can get a like tradi traditional art crowd. Um, but yeah, it just like taught us a lot about how to like interact, sort of like how people consider like free mints versus like paid mints, um, like retention rates, all of those things. Um, but ultimately it's like, it has, it was really fun. Uh, I think it's good that we're stopping for now, but uh, when we would start again or will in some kind of way with these more traditional authors, um, I think we'll be much better prepared because it really was like we, like I always say we um, sort of like built a rocket ship uh, while we flew it in that sense. Um, it was actually the case. So for any sort of like new, new art Basel or any other new event, we uh, had to like develop new things that we thought were cool. We're still using them, but it was always just like iteration, 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 um, which is like quite fun if you're building a product. So you were thrown into the deep end a little bit in terms of having just created this generative art market, like art market platform and then suddenly being thrust into the spotlight of one of the world's largest art fairs, Art Basel. And it's interesting to hear about how the conversations evolved over the course of the different shows. But as people's understanding of generative art and crypto art evolved, how did FX Hash evolve alongside that? Like over the course of the year, how did your team morph mm -hmm. and kind of develop or mature from your first Art Basel through to the last Art Basel? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it was, I think in the beginning it was a lot of like part-time contributors in that sense. So we essentially, in the same way that I reached out to Cypher, a lot of others did as well. And I think we ultimately ended up at like 12, 13, sort of like part-time contributors, like most of them being in the space for far longer than I even knew the space, like already writing their theses on like Gentle of Art in like 2010 or like being on Cold Pen, like all of these uh, all of these things um and then we actually realized that this is like a viable business and we could sort of like start to pay people uh with the starting of the payment um like the task that we all naturally fall, fell into and that since became more of not, not like hey it's nice if you do it but okay this is now my actual job and responsibility and i need to do it and then sort of like a actual core team that sort of like build and ship and continue the product uh, build. So that was like, I think, uh, six, seven people in that sense, really uh, also then like leaving their old jobs and joining FX hash, which I think at least for me was extremely scary in the, in the beginning. Because it's like, Hey, it's like a company, like just been around for like six months. It's like every, everybody says crypto is going to sh uh, going down. And then you're just like, yeah, okay. I'll, Join that company. That sounds like a fun experience. Um, but it was it was like 
one of the best experiences I did, at least speaking for myself. Um, so that was really became sort of like the part. And, and I think you can also see that with, I think up until April, we were in this like beta period. Then for like a month, we closed down, like developed and like published like a new project, which we call, or like a new new iteration of FXH, which we then called like FXH 1.0. And then it was just like about like putting it into a stable state. And then I think when we were at Miami, um, we all met each other before at times at like events, but all, all, always only like two or three people. And then in Miami, we did our first like offsite, so to speak, where we all flew to Miami to sort of like uh, get to know each other personally. I mean, after, after having like spoken for like a year on Discord and everything, but like it's always different if you see each other in person. Um, and then sort of like we really thought about, okay, what is like the future of FXH? What can we do? Uh, like, where are we actually in this like broader market? Um, yeah, and then I think you can sort of like be like from then after Miami, sort of like right around now, um, there's like another sort of like, like up until sort of like FXS 2.0, there's like this chapter and then afterwards there will be another one and it's just like always continuously rethinking how we do it. So it kind of sounds like it started as this sort of fragmented passion project and then over the course yes. of, over the course of a single year, as signified by each Art Basel event, it was mm -hmm. almost each stage of legitimizing it as a business. And as you said, it must have it must have been quite scary to notice that everyone was willing to take this leap of faith and you know abandon their secure full time jobs and take a risk on trying to build this business from this like from the bottom up. Um, and especially as you said, you know when you're facing something like a bear market. It can be a very intimidating process because you're basically saying there are no guarantees, especially when you're dabbling in something like art, where people people before crypto always saw art as something of a speculative investment. So then when you take a fairly a fairly new genre of art like generative, which yes, it existed all the way back in the sixties, but it's only really come to the fore or in the public eye a lot more again now when you really think about it and you step back, where does generative art stand, not just in the NFT space, but in the art world overall that FX hash is trying to still seize the opportunity for? Mm, I, I think that question is really hard to answer as it's like an ongoing project. We internally, or I personally think that generative art is or can be the art movement of our, of our era, as mentioned due to the fact that um, technology, art, sort of like the way we consume, the way we consume art, like all of these sort of like, at least we are trying to make it like a little bit different and we sort of like hope that we can get more people into it and genitive art can be a nice segue into like a deeper appreciation of art. Because if you look at, if you go on the street and ask sort of people, hey, what is your favorite like artist or songwriter? People will name you like 10 names directly. If you ask someone, what is your favorite artist or art form? They'll like look at you, like maybe one person out of 10 or 20 might answer, be like, hey, I like this, this and that. But like most of them have no clue or are not confident enough to sort of like know and understand it. And genital thought really can help due to this like easy or much easier entry point can really understand people what they actually like, what they dislike, because you can only like grow as a person in like any content if you, if you actually try it out. If you always just look at like galleries or museums, yes, you might know, okay, I like this and I like that, but that's mostly just like pre-chosen by someone else and you know, okay, this is good or this is bad, but when you actually have to like do the choice in that sense for your own, um, you grow much more. Um, so I'm not really sure if that answers your question, but I think. So you just mentioned that you consider generative art sort of the the art genre of our generation. And despite being a visually and technically compelling art form, why mm -hmm. do you consider this movement so important? What makes it so compelling? Because it's sort of like it has the potential to democratize a lot of things. So as I was trying to say a little bit earlier, like right now, a lot of things in the art world or in general are curated top down. So it's like a few people or decision makers, curators, museums, galleries, institutions saying this is good. And if this is good, then this should be bought in that sense. And um, 
therefore they can also ch or not they that always sounds like so but like um it's, an, <laughs> it's true uh but essentially like even if i would like to buy from a specific artist and even if i would have the money like at times i'm not allowed to because i don't buy three pieces or because i don't like buy two and then don't want to a museum and all of these little things that exist um and 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 I just think that with this sort of like bottom up way of doing it, of letting the artists just like upload their, upload their things, giving them the power with the collector, giving them the power to support any artist that they want, if they're there in time, um, it can be really good. And then on top of that, I think it just makes sense that everything we do will get more technical. Any children that is born right now, at least in the Western world, like grows up with so many screens around them. Not saying that it's good, it's actually really bad, but like it's a fact in that sense. So for them, digital art in that sense will not exist as it will only be art. If like, if you're three and you're looking at an iPad, like you won't care what the artwork is on when you're like 15, 16, or even 25. Um, and more and more people will be able or should be able to code in that sense. So there's just like a lot of different sort of like trends that we're seeing that sort of like allows us to at least make a confident um, or at, uh, that we're at least confident that generative art will be a thing, is a thing. And especially when talking with institutions, museums, um, they are, they want to showcase it and they will showcase it. And some already have showcased it in the past, but much more or much more is to come in that sense. I like your point that, you know, future generations are not going to discriminate too much between whether it is a physical art piece or a digital art piece, because art will be art no matter what medium it's presented on. And also how that can kind of lead into this idea of fostering creativity through code and changing, you know, the role of, I guess, the human as a passive consumer of something like of someone just watching a screen to someone who's actively engaging in the creation of something online or in a digital space. But then at the same time, you know, I, I was also at the Art Basels. I'm aware of how rudimentary some of the conversations and some of the questions that were being <laughs> asked were. And one distinct one that I remember was that people saw generative art as just computer art, something that the mm -hmm. art create, like the computer created that couldn't necessarily be attributed to the artist who actually created the code. So do you think this reputation has shifted or is there still an education process that needs to happen? And do you think in that, the generative art is starting to become better appreciated in a way that it actually deserves? Mm, I th yes, it is shifting, but it's not, not that we don't need to continuously educate people on it. In that sense, what, what I said earlier, you always have to contextualize things. Yes. The ultimately the computer or the algorithm is sort of like the ones like actually making the choice or like making the choice with randomness but it's the artist who gives the freedom or like gives a degree of freedom to the code to the algorithm to run so it's not like this is like everything like it's it's not like you're just i don't know like throwing like a dart at a map and then be like okay i'm going to do a vacation there but it's like carefully planned by the artist on, on what to do and i think especially there like events can be a great showcase of that especially if you um go into this and create like experiences that have sort of like a co-creation aspect to it where people can actually understand how the artwork how the final output works how the code works they can interact with it um and that is now what we're like focusing on or focused on like we, we did something in, in tokyo where we we had like a big touchscreen where people could then like play around with the artwork that they would ultimately mint and really like customize it to their needs and to their wants and um from the feedback that we got that was like really sort of like eye-opening experience for both the artist for them to see sort of like how collectors or consumers in that sense interact with your art but also for new collectors of for, for new people new to the technology new to all of this so like how you can interact with an art piece and that it doesn't have to be this static i'm like two minutes away from the artwork and i look at it in like weird way trying to understand it but rather i can like interact with it so we spoke of sort of the education piece when it comes to people coming to interact with generative art as a viewer or as a consumer 
But then we were also saying that this is often the entry point for a lot of generative artists who haven't thought to put their work out there. So what has the educational process been for the artists themselves as they interact with, you know, the FX hash team? How are the questions <laughs> changing for them in terms of, you know, is it something as basic as how do I market my artwork or what are the questions that are being asked? It's like everything for like, from like total beginners and like, hey, this is interesting. Like, how can I do it? How can I do it if I cannot code? How can I do it if I code? And we always just, or like with the people adapt with coding, we just try to lead them to our document, documentation. Although that is fairly technical and is currently also getting like a revamp. So we, we, we know that, that like, as we are, the problem that we have is that we are an open platform, meaning anyone can utilize our tools, meaning, but, but also meaning that we just, due to the sheer size we have we cannot give like a one-on-one -on -one consultation with any artist that would be like we have like more than 4,500 artists that have uh, dropped something on FX hash um, that is way more than any other platform has in that sense so through the sheer scale we have we cannot go as personal and as detailed maybe as we would like to um, but ultimately, um, that's what we're currently like building on and like trying to educate him on, on anything code related, but especially on also this like market, how, how to market yourself, how to price your work, right? Especially the pricing part is extremely hard as artists at times are not as in the community and they're sort of like a little detached from it. And especially during times of like high uncertainty, high fear, um, like low consumer spending in that sense. Um, two weeks can make a difference if you can sell your artwork for like 100,000 euros in total or 20,000 or even just like 1,000. And that in itself is really, really stupid because it shows how much we like humans or like collectors are driven by sort of like outside, outside things. Uh, but it's the reality that we're living in. So we just need to make sure that we can showcase that to artists and showcase um or just like train them or like guide them and give them the tools they need and what's also very interesting about the way fx hash operates is the fact that you have a very two-directional conversation with yourselves as the platform platform providers and the creators themselves so when the creators have a request it's actually a very f straightforward procedure in terms of getting it into uh, getting it in front of your eyes so that you guys can respond adapt fx hash as a product to deliver something that artists will find helpful to use so i think last year you guys launched fx text you also had fx mm -hmm. params um you know you've also incorporated fiat payments uh for non-crypto mm -hmm. natives most recently you announced fx hash 2.0 which is bridging to ethereum so can you share sort of like a top level overview of all of these plans because you guys are very <laughs> uh, top level overview will be hard and i'm sure to miss many um i mean essentially you're right we always try to listen as much as possible to the community because like that is a like benefit that a lot of like web one web two companies don't have we have like a direct access a direct chat with like most of our artists but also more, most of our collectors and that is feedback that is really valuable and we try to do our best to sort of like incorporate all of that um i think right now it's still at a sort of like mix of what we what like what we or like uh, especially cypher sort of like had in mind when creating it and now we are getting to a stage where we can finally unleash it and unleash him and his ideas and his visions for this like broader space of generative art and that's not, that that might sound like weird but like i'm really excited for it because like he as mentioned like he has been doing that for the last 10 15 years and he has a lot of ideas especially when it comes to like um event design interaction design so like how you uh, what i was alluding to how you can interact with art with your art in that sense um but also how you can make the overall experience better and nicer um for um yeah for for web3 native people but also especially for those people that are just in for the art and, and they don't necessarily care about uh, crypto as much i mean i would say i like the internet but i don't understand how the internet works and like the different protocols running it and I think ultimately that is also what will happen to the crypto space. It will always be like the transactional layer. And therefore it's really good if a blockchain has like really good tech. Um, but ultimately all of these pain points that we currently have won't be visible 
hopefully, maybe soon. I don't know. Um, but yeah, as far as like future plans, I think biggest one right now is integrating E. It's really important that it's not bridging because we're not leaving Tezos because we really like Tezos and it has like a, actually, not, not because it's called test talks, but actually, um, because it, yeah, especially institutions, museums, um, they favor Tezos way more because they, you can, you can do some things with a scale that you cannot do or they cannot pay for, uh, on ETH. Um, so yeah, it's just like giving the options for artists to also use that again, giving optionality. And then I think it will just be building out, continue to build out, um, more platform updates. So content, continue to iterate on FX params, continue to iterate on, uh, continue to iterate on redeemables, which is our way for artists to also sell something on top of the digital artwork, mostly that is prints, plotters, or, or anything like that. Um, and then you'll see like another platform, UI, UX, we we've recently been able to finally hire someone like full-time just for this, um, meaning like UI, UX, like product design, and like a product manager. So um, that is what I'm really excited about because we also know that like the platform is notoriously hard to navigate. Um, if you're like new to this, um, but yeah, as mentioned, we've been a team of five essentially for the last 18 months. Now we are getting bigger um, and now we can finally do cool stuff again. I like we've always did cool stuff, but more cool stuff. So you're changing the look and feel of the brand, the navigation of the site, the like you're I don't also... look and feel. I don't know. We try to keep that just there's like, like we re recently did like a site mapping. And there's a lot of ways you can click on the site and like we t i want to keep we want to keep like the aesthetics and all of it um but there's a lot of just like simple improvements where we don't lose our identity because i don't like our brand is like one of our strongest assets that we have um we should definitely not lose that i think it's just making it easier for people to use it if, because if i show fx hash to like friends that are not just normal art appreciators in that sense and don't want to or don't have anything to within the Web3 world, like they look at it and be like, okay, nice, but like, I don't know how to use it. And also like the documentation and the how-tos does not help. So it's really simplifying it um, and making it um, so that it's, yeah, just like reachable by everyone or usable by everyone. Also, for example, if you can't speak English, like you should be able to use FX hash, but we need to find solutions for that. So these are sort of like the, the, the changes that we think about while still keeping um, our brand identity. So helping people navigate, explore, discover, and also just generally expanding the community of people who would come to use a platform like FX hash, whether they are on the creator side or the collector side. And then mm -hmm. with all of that together, and let's let's cast our minds to the future where you achieve all of these things on your to-do list. What does that do for the big picture vision for FX Hash? Like, what is this big picture that we're trying to create for FX Hash? I mean, I think our, our I think we wrote our vision down back once, and we essentially said we want to provide artists and collectors basically the the whole life cycle of their like artistic career. So, meaning you can start on FX Hash, but ultimately you will also be able to utilize this for like museums, galleries, all of it. So ultimately, we just want to empower people. We want to make it, or not not people, we want to empower artists to create the art that they would like and give them the tools that they need in like a large scale way. We want to empower like institutionals, we want to empower like curators, galleries to also build out their sort of like presence in that sense, be it just with a curational layer, like for example, we've seen with Ten Dollar Art, um, or for example, like uh, the HUK in, in Basel, basically utilizing like our technology to, to run their own uh, NFT shop or like digital art shop. Um, but yeah, it's also to be perfectly honest, like we don't know what will happen like in five or in ten years. We just know that once we are there, we know what we want to do, and we want to and, and we'll continue to do it like based on our vision or like um, not emotions. I'm missing the English word right now. Based on like the, the common the common ground that we all have internally and with the community. Um, what's that word? It doesn't matter. But like I think you know what I mean. 
Yeah, it's very much based on a value-driven mission. Principles, values. Yes, that's the word. Sorry. <laughs> Principles and values. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, and it's, yeah. So with these principles and values in mind, what are mm -hmm. sort of the challenges that you anticipate or are trying to prepare <laughs> for? Because obviously you can't anticipate all of them. There's always going to be the random wild card. But what do you think mm -hmm. are your biggest obstacles that you are preparing to overcome? Um, I think right now um, one of the biggest obstacles is sort of like um, attention or in, in like really right now right now it's like consumer spending consumer spending is like down like in on across everything over the world and like mm -hmm. art is one of the first things that gets cut if you then think okay like the art within the crypto space like then you can see how this gets like even harder in that sense so theoretically um, that is a struggle I think there's an increasing competition of like new platforms and marketplaces especially platforms um, coming up, um, we are worried in that sense, but I'm not worried too much as I do think that we have and will have the better product, the better team, and ultimately, um, the more, like, the better values in that sense. We are and have been here really for the art to advance the space and not really there to just like, take liquidity away and sort of like just drop a platform to have like artists drop subpar projects and approach them and all of that um yeah um competition the future in general how long this world crisis lasts even though it's like a crisis since i've lived here in that sense <laughs> um so yeah like a, a few things you cannot control all of them you, you can just do our best and i think if we do our best then we have nothing to be worried about so it's all the conventional challenges of a bear market. And I guess with all of the work that's going into investing into the development of FX hash during this downtime, you are essentially mm -hmm. preparing for when the market flips and consumer mm -hmm. spend increases once again. And you can really test your product up against, you know, the new competitors that might arise during that time. But mm -hmm. then when it comes to looking beyond FX hash and generative art, how do you plan to keep generative art at the fore of people's minds mm -hmm. when it risks kind of fading from public consciousness, especially, especially if, very frankly, when you see the rise of generative AI and the focus on AI generated imagery and the curiosity mm -hmm. and tinkering around with that, how do you make sure that the sophistication that goes into crafting generative art through code is still appreciated and recognized and is still popular? Mm, very good question. However, to me, that is not a contradiction. So for example, you can look at, like if, like we even have AI stuff, well, not AI stuff, that's just what we have, AI artworks uh, on FX hash. So to me, like the rise in general, to AI art in that sense, like it's a subsector of generative art as a whole to me. Um, what is interesting is, for example, like a lot of other platforms, uh, like uh, store everything only on chain, meaning you're really limited in like the file size sort of like of your artwork. Uh, we do store it in IPFS and soon to be also on chain, both Tez and ETH. But through this, you can actually create like mini guns, for example, and have your own little AI. Um, yeah, a, a neural network in that sense, uh, and 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 run like the generative process on that. So zero diagonal, the end that we uh, showed in, I think in Paris it was, um, and also in Miami, then also even at Tao where we had a piece uh, with with uh, for art also Miami. Like I'm not worried about the AI stuff. Ultimately, it's just about integrating that and making it so that it's like a. Uh, worthwhile for for the artist as well as the collector, and then how do we solve the general like issue? Um, I think we will continue to do more events, more large scale events, also events that are not necessarily with like a one hundred percent crypto focus, but rather with the focus on art and technology, because these events are already set out. These events are already very well visited, especially for example, like in the APEC region. Um, like these immersive experiences are like the best selling art experiences that the humanity has to offer right now. Um, and sort of like params will be one way into it, but that will be all on us. And then it's also about like working with museums, 
um, trying to show them sort of like our tooling, but also show them why it's narrative and like sort of like be having like a backseat view to all of that. Um, and there will be a lot more things coming out like end of this year, but also like uh, 2024 because museums have like such a long uh, cycle of when they can afford or when they are allowed to do stuff. Um, yeah, so just like continue to work with museums, institutions, continuing to do our thing. And um, ultimately, if you show this kind of art to random strangers, or like especially younger strangers, and they understand really what is important, then they like it. And um, so, yeah, not too worried by hype cycles or anything like that. That's good. <laughs> I don't think you should be. Um, but then it sounds like, you know, there's plenty for people to look forward to and keep track of. So before we you know, wrap up this conversation, I'd like to ask if there are any announcements that you'd like to share or any <laughs> updates that you think people need to make a note of in their calendars so that they know where you are and what you're doing in the near future. Um, I would love to. But we, we recently, or like with, with like our latest, like bigger uh, update, which was Perance, we like said, okay, on this date, we release it. We didn't release it on that date and that annoyed like a lot of people. So uh, we just, uh, we don't give out dates anymore. But really like I'm excited a lot about like the ETH integration. I think with that, there will be like a larger scale overhaul. Um, this, yeah, it's, it's just like a lot of interesting stuff that we are now finally unleashed and, and can afford to build and, and can do our focus on. Um, so yeah, there's lots of like, exciting announcements coming as soon as possible or like as soon as we can. Um, ultimately, just follow us on right now Twitter, maybe th soon threads, maybe in three months it's something else. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> wherever the most eyes are, we will be. Okay, so plenty of things to come dates, TBD, people should just yeah. follow along anyway and <laughs> get excited for yeah. something soon. Something is yeah. coming, it is happening so, soon. Yeah. When precisely, we're not sure, but not too long. <laughs> is not that too right? long. No, yeah, may maybe that. And maybe like I'm excited for like an event that we do in Berlin. It will be like our first self hosted one. We just like need to confirm locations, which is a bit annoying, but probably around like end of August at the late September. Then at Basel Miami will be really fun. Um, I think that we can also like hopefully do something, but it's looking good. And then for the rest of the year, or like for 2024, I don't even know it yet in that sense. Like we're just like too far away. Yeah, so that means there are plenty more surprises then for both yes. you and everyone else who's watching. <laughs> yeah, trying to. Well, anyway, Paul, thank you so much for all of your ideas, your views, your perspectives, mm -hmm. and I'm sure we'll have you back on the show at a point in the future, probably when these announcements have actually been announced. <laughs> been um, announced. And, <laughs> and we'll pick up our conversation from there. But until then, thank you so much. Awesome. Nice. Yeah. Thank you for letting me be here and speak soon. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>